Welcome back to Bones and Stones. We have a special guest today, uh, Lawrence Kruger. Uh, he's a friend of mine who works in Kruger Park, so we all can get very jealous at the stories he's going to tell us today. Um, Lawrence runs, and he's the co-founder of the Sasani Trust, and he works with the Organization of Tropical Studies at a research center based in Skakuza, but I'll let Lawrence get into those details for fear of getting them wrong. Lawrence also has a special place in my heart because He's one of the few people who can tolerate me when I'm screaming at, a, at the TV uh, supporting the Springboks. <laughs> in fact, encouraging me. <laughs> um, Lawrence, thanks very much for joining us uh, today. Do you mind just giving a bit of background into what you do? Sure, I just want to start by saying Parker. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, in a, I'm a plant ecologist by trade and um, Turns out I'm sixth generation botanist. Um, I have a, a long history of uh, family history of, of forestry and, and uh, forest ecology. And um, I studied at UCT um, and actually initially wanted to study leopards. That was my, my big focus. And um, by the time I got to my, the end of my third year, I just found the botanical realm more interesting. You know, whether it be the case of the academics being more charismatic or the questions being more interesting, I kind of fell into that. Uh, and it's the only time my father's ever questioned my choices when I came home and said, Dad, I'll be doing honours in botany. He said, are you sure? But um, so my history is, is forest ecology. Um, and um, I started running, well, started working with OTS in 2003, an organisation for tropical studies. It's a study abroad programme um, that was started by E.O. Wilson, actually, um, in the 1960s. And the idea was to get students out of their laboratories and, and the lecture spaces into the field. And we all know the value of experiential learning and, and field-based learning in particular. So it started as a graduate program. And then uh, about 20 years ago, we started undergraduate programs. And in 2003, we started the, the Kruger Park program with a whole bunch of really reluctant partners. You know, nobody knew OTS was. Um, UCT and FITS were a little skeptical. Sandparks weren't so enamored by the idea of, you know, 25 unfettered students, students roaming around the landscape in the Kruger. But we, we built up trust over time and within two, three years, nobody had been eaten. And um, we, were in, we were in still in good shape and sent our students in one piece. And so we proceeded with, with OTS and it, it really does transform lives. I mean, a month in the Kruger or Mapungubwe or parts of the Western Cape is gonna do wonders for not only your understanding of ecology, but also how to manage these systems. And then, I guess about 10 years ago, we realized, even though we had, you know, 20% of our students were South African, and all our staff were South African, we weren't doing enough for young South Africans, particularly previously disadvantaged South Africans. So, we started in Sasani Trust with a couple of local friends, David Bunn, Shadak Klachwayo, um, Karen Vickers is actually the director of the Trust. And, um, and the, the idea was to run these parallel programs, so OTS for international students, and then the, the Sasani Trust for um, mainly South African students. And then that interaction becomes really important. And that, I guess, in a nutshell, is what I've been doing for the last 17 years, roaming around the Kruger Park. Yeah, so, so you, uh, the, the reason sort of you've come on today to chat to us also is, is to talk about the heritage type stuff that you engage with. So the, I know, because yeah. I've, I've been with you at Mapungubwe, so, you, you do Mapungubwe, is there any other, other archaeological sites or heritage spaces that you visit? Yeah, so, well, I, I guess it definitely is broad. Um, and actually, thinking about one of the lectures you offer the students is, at one point, you flippantly, I don't think it's very flippant, but you referred to rock art as graffiti, or you drew that analogy. And, um, which is actually quite powerful because I talk about it all the time. So we, we visit various rock art sites in the, in the Cape. We work with John Parkerton. Uh, we visit urban, the urban centers of Cape Town and Johannesburg. And we visit a, a, a range of different sites in the Kruger. There's some fabulous rock art paintings just um, 50 k's from here. We visit Tulumela. Um, and it's, it's very explicitly done. Um, and happy to share my thoughts around that. Yeah, that's, and, and then just in, on that, what's the feedback from this, like local students versus international students in terms of the heritage? Uh, and is it like the first time they're getting to see some of this? Are they very interested? Is it uh, you know, a really sort of positive experience? Yeah. 
So I guess before I go there, I think one of the real strengths of South African education is that it's transdisciplinary and that it's also, you can't these days just engage in, in blue sky science. As a, as a young ecologist or conservation scientist, you have to think about the broader social and broader economic context for anything you do. And um, so for the South Africans, they're already kind of transdisciplinary fit. They, they realize that in studying elephants, you need to understand at the broader social context and so on. Um, the Americans, and you know, we also work with um, European students and Australian students, um, they're not quite in the same boat yet, although they have, they have an appreciation for it. Um, and so it's fundamentally important for us to be able to take our students to some of these rock art sites or to Tulumela, the Iron Age sites, or to museums in Cape Town, because it forces students to think more broadly about ecology the fact that you could be working in the Kruger Park and you have to consider people as part of the environment and pe people as part of the ecological system. So I think the reaction is always enormously positive. It's often blended with a degree of surprise. So, um, you know, particularly when they get to work with you, Tim, or um, John Parkerton, um, or whoever the guides are at the time, we've got some great guides in Mapungubwe and Tulumela who are A, charismatic, but also very knowledgeable. It fundamentally alters the way they view the management of these systems. So often when the students arrive, they think about it in terms of uh, fire ecology, building fences, um, often keeping people out. And by the time they finish the course, particularly through the work of the archeologists and our engagement with the likes of yourselves, it really shifts how they think about conservation efforts and, and what's most important. And the fact that people are part of the, the ecosystem and are now considered, for instance, important part of the ignition sources and fires. And then, um, you know, in, I know, we've had a, sorry, Matt, do you want to take that away? Yeah, yeah, sorry, Lawrence, just uh, getting back to something you said a little bit earlier, where when you sat your parents down and told them what you were going to study, and they said, oh, you sure, don't worry. We all had that same conversation with our parents as well, we all studying archaeology. But um, just to maybe touch a little bit on uh, Kruger Park's management of, you know, the natural heritage side of things and then the cultural heritage, heritage side of things. Because obviously, as you say, the two go hand in hand, but perhaps the management of them is a little bit different. Could you maybe talk to Kruger Park's management of those two different kind of um, aspects of heritage? Yeah, so obviously the, um, the history of, of uh, natural heritage management is, is long and, and clear to see. And actually that's changed quite a bit from sort of fortress conservation to... Um, a far more engaged approach using a systems, systems approach and social ecological systems. And just, just as an indication of the, the change in philosophy and the change in language, five years ago when it came to poaching, they considered the poaching problem to be a, um, you know, a, a conservation issue and, and fortress conservation and a real command and control approach. Uh, about three years ago, that's the language that they were using switched to beneficiation and benefit sharing. And now they treat um, the rhino poaching problem as a social justice issue. And it's actually quite remarkable just how much sand parks has changed their vocabulary, but also their approaches to these issues. And that's a really nice um, platform to talk a little bit about the cultural heritage side of things. So it's always been, well, historically it's, it's uh, been an important element of our understanding the park. So thinking about trade routes, um, between the Kruger and Maputo, Lorenzo Marx at the time, and they've got these um, uh, huts that have been preserved you know, along the, the, these, these primary routes. Um, there's some important archeological sites through the park, primarily with a focus on, on um, the Iron Age period. But it's, I guess up until about 15 years ago, it was of interest and important to preserve those areas. Um, but in the last while there, there's been a real shifting attention to um, engaging a lot more with that. And you think about Mapungubwe being um, developed as a cultural heritage site rather than a, a natural history conservation area. I mean, it's a huge step forward um, in South Africa, but also globally. So um, let's see, in Kruger, they... So a, a good example would be when you go on trails, people aren't just interested... I mean, obviously, seeing wild game on, on foot is a hell of a thing and being able to camp under the baobabs and the stars is great but um, people are asking more and more questions about um, the cultural history aspects so I think um, 
you know, very formally in, in the conservation policies in the park. It's, it's they, you know, they, they use ecosystem services as a platform for looking at. So there's um, those that are associated with the ecology, those that are associated with um, education and research, but cultural history plays a really important part of that. So it's, it's written to the constitution um, that they have to A, pay close attention, but B, actively manage um, their cultural history sites. But it's, it's definitely, it's, it's becoming more and more part of the, um, the conversation uh, mm -hmm. amongst cons uh, both the conservationists and the researchers. But I, I just don't think it sees enough attention quite yet. There's certainly growing interest, um, but it's and and it, it will come. But you know, right now, Rona poaching is, is soaking up all the funding, and and uh, the section ranges where they used to, uh, you know, GPS um, animal movements and so on, but also sites of archaeological importance. They just don't have the time anymore. They, I mean, they're so swamped by what they what they have to do during the day. Yeah. Uh, talking about the um the care i'll get you in a second uh it, about the um the inter, inter, introducing people to archaeological sites with some of the tourism stuff that i was doing up north back in the day it, a lot of people coming up there to see animals gone wild dog tracking experiences and so on and we'd spend a morning or an afternoon or sometimes a day with them showing them archaeological sites simply because i was around people had no idea about it no real interest in it but as soon as we got onto the site and started to look at the stone tools on the ground or walk up the hill and find a settlement suddenly people's interest started peaking and quite often by the end of it they said do we have time to go look at another site or can we go see some more rock art or can we see something else so it's a, it's once people are there and they see how fascinating this really is you can capture them but it's getting people interested you know without knowing what what's out there that's quite a challenge so Kara, do you want to do you want to jump in yeah, so um, this is all real, you know, sort of very, very fascinating um, uh, sort of topics being discussed here. Um, and obviously, you know, we all think of Kruger National Park as a very sort of natural landscape. That's why we go there. But but there is this sort of cultural history component. I was just wondering if, if you could maybe briefly describe, uh, because we've touched upon rock art, we've pushed, touched upon sort of Iron Age, uh, but what, what type of time depth is, um, uh, is captured within the park, within its archaeological sites, um, and, and if maybe you could just talk about uh, some of the, the sort of Iron Age activities. You've mentioned trade briefly, um, but you know, what, what, what types of settlements were there and, and what type of, of trade would they have been hosting? Yeah, well, and um, you guys as archaeologists might um, be somewhat uh, underwhelmed by my understanding, but I think there are four important features here. The, the one is obviously the, the, the sand people, the Bushmen, and that goes back to the very beginnings. Um, because they would have occupied, and as you guys can tell me so much more, they would have occupied most of the um, Southern African districts. So um, there are rock art sites all up the spine of the, of the park, although the geological features um, that are encouraged residents are, are somewhat limited. So there are not that many caves in the South, mm. although there are these beautiful granitic um, outcrops. So there's definitely uh, a range of uh, um, rock art sites up the spine and that dates, as I said, right back to the very beginnings of the occupancy of, of Southern Africa. Um, then there are the, the Iron Age settlements in the far north associated with the great Zimbabwe civilization. Uh, Tulumela, I think, is the, the fourth and the last of the great citadels, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that dates back to sort of six to eight hundred years ago. Um, and uh, they've They've done a fabulous job of um, rebuilding it. And I think it's one of the few great Zimbabwe sites that have been rebuilt in, in South Africa. And um, that's used a lot of visitation. Um, there, is, there has been a bit of work done at uh, Makahane, which is further down. So it's all along that sort of Levuvu Gorge district. Um, just as a quick aside, we've done some really fun plant demography work. And, as an archaeologist, again, you, you could tell me so much more, but the idea that um, particularly Iron Age settlement sites leave botanical footprints in the landscape, uh, whether it be a cases in otherwise Combritum felt um, at the top of catenal sequences, um, we were interested in whether you see you know, denser stands of baobabs, um, and that relates to some of the baobab germination work we've done where uh, baobabs actually germinate better in the presence of humans because they remove all the browsers and the baboons and actually since we eat the fruit you know the germination in, improves and then also just looking at um, even age stands of baobabs if that exists um, increased densification of fruiting species like vanguera or, or marilla 
Um, so we got to spend a bit of time in that Makahane district. And yeah, so that's another a key site for us. Then I guess more recently would be the Iron Age smelting sites around Palaboa. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the trade routes that, yeah, and again, you guys could tell me a lot more about that, but it seemed like there was a, a well-established trade route between, say, Mapungubwe, K2, down through um, Guiani area into Palaboa. And in chatting to an archaeologist some time ago, there was he made mention of a range of smelting sites along this key trade route. Mm -hmm. And so working in the Palaboa district, there's a beautifully maintained um, archaeological site there. Mm, and then more recently, you know, thinking about um, uh, the, the, the communities that were forcibly removed in the Skukuza district, the um, Salichi people, and then up in the north uh, um, above the Levuvu. So that would be the kind of the, the fourth element, the more recent occupancy yeah. of, of the Kruger Park district. Thanks, Lawrence. I think that actually sums up the sort of distribution of because you know we don't know a lot about the sites in Kruger, but they are all over the place. Um, uh, there are a lot of earlier Stone Age sites as well, and you know it's really fascinating stuff. And I think that gives us a really good idea of what's what's going on up there, and mm -hmm. certainly potential for a lot of research for for people who who, who want to get into the park. Um, but I think we're running out of time there, unfortunately. I could definitely yeah, okay. chat about this longer. It's really interesting. But when the lockdown is over, we're obviously all coming to visit you, Lawrence, and we'll continue this conversation somewhere in the bush, maybe in the background you have up there. <laughs> but thanks very much for joining us and sharing some of your knowledge, um, telling us a bit about sure. open uh, And hopefully, who knows, maybe we will be able to sit down in the park, have a beer, and, and dig up some archaeology one day. And watch the bokeh. Just a, a quick final thoughts. <laughs> so we've, we've built a research station here now in partnership with Sand Parks and they've invested a lot of their time and effort and, and money and we, we really are interested in this transdisciplinary education space and you know it's transformative for these students, these ecology students, um, social science students and otherwise when they visit um, some of these rock art sites and it's one of the places where we really think about sense of place so we we take our students off to this it's a, it's a big granitic boulder um, and we look out on a stretch of river and there's this big, beautiful elephant painting. And um, we just get them to sit there for an hour and just down tools, you know, clear their minds of all the academic work they've done and just consider what it must have been like to be here sort of 600, 1,000, 2,000 years ago and consider what it is that they want to leave South Africa with. And it's, it's quite remarkable to see what happens to these youngsters you know we live such busy lives and we've and we've just lost that um that temporal aspect about it because everything's so sh short and sharp and for them to be sitting in this beautiful rock art site and enjoy the vista awesome. knowing that somebody was there two thousand years ago it's fantastic no that's great so i look forward to seeing you guys up yeah. here yeah and thanks for showing our heritage to people from our country and from abroad as well it's fantastic awesome thank you